party will have 15 minutes to present its arguments. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. Uh, if you wish to do so, let me know when you take the podium. I'll do my best to try to monitor that, and you can watch it on the screen as well. The arguments are being visually and audibly recorded to be posted online, so please remain behind the podium and keep your voices up. Do not use the names of any children in this matter. Just refer to it as child or initials, whichever works for you. We have read your briefs and we are ready to begin with your argument. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. My name is uh, James P. Reddy, Jr. I'm here on behalf of the FLI, Timothy Bohannon. At this time, I'd like to reserve three minutes of my time for rebuttal, if I may. Thank you. Briefly, the facts of this, Your Honor, is somewhat critical to the analysis of the case. In the present case, the father had filed three motions to show cause, the first of which was back in June of 2016, at a time when the child in question was just 14 years old. He wanted to address his lack of parenting time with his daughter, uh, Kay, who was 14 at the time. The trial court did have a hearing on the motions. Uh, however, the trial court limited each party to one half hour to place, to pursue, to present their case on several motions to show cause, motions to modify, and an objections to an administrative order as to child support. That decision was appealed. This very same panel held, handled that case in reverse and remanded to the trial court. And of extreme importance to this court, and it was authored by Justice Carr, when she said that father's multiple contempt motions had been pending for 11 months prior to the hearing in the trial court. And I quote, given the fact that there is no way to go back in time and restore missed parenting time, the best a parent can hope for is that he or she will be awarded future substantial time and incentives to deter the other parent from further interference. When the child at issue is a teenager, as in here, timely and full consideration of the issue is even more critical. What happens from that point forward is another almost six months goes by and the trial court had another hearing in January of 2019 respectfully submit to the court that the appellant got neither future substantial time nor incentives to deter the other parent, in this case the mother, from interference with his parenting time. That trial court that decision, as I, I'm sorry, that court of appeals decision came out July 25th, 2018. Six, almost six months later, there's another hearing, which is uh, what we're here before today. What is critical is that the child at issue went from age 14 at the time the original motions were filed to 16 and a half at the time the ultimate decision was rendered. All the while, the child controlled and limited her time with father with the assistance and help of her mother. The record is replete with the number of times that mother went and picked this child up early from father's care. What also occurred is during the pendency of the case, there was counseling that was set up and the, I respectfully submit that the daughter torpedoed the counseling in that she did not talk, she did not open up to the counselor in no way. The daughter was also under individual counseling throughout the pendency, or, I'm sorry, during the pendency of the case and the father wanted to make sure that, <coughs> excuse me, his whole, the whole story was being presented in the child's individual counseling. He asked for the records that caused such an uproar that that counselor no longer continued with the child. Appellant's concern was, is his side of the story being forwarded or being presented <coughs> to the child's counselor to get a true assessment as well as a true way to go forward uh, with this very serious issue. All the counseling stops, the guardian ad litem during the pendency of the case, despite the existence of Superintendency Rule 48 for guardians, where the guardian can recommend counseling, can recommend a psychological assessment, can do these types of things, she does nothing. Counsel, just I want to make sure I understand something. When you just said appellant was concerned that his side of the story was being presented, are you talking about some joint counseling or daughter's individual counseling at this point? Your Honor, the father had the ability in the joint counseling to present his side of what's going on. 
in the daughter's individual counseling, he was unaware whether the daughter who had been leaving uh, parenting sessions early, he wasn't aware whether the daughter was actually telling the counselor what's going on. So he wanted the notes to see if that, if that was the case. That blew up and the counselor uh, then terminated after just six and a half months. The, all along, what they did is they empowered this 14-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old to control what's happening when she sees her father. What do you recall back when the divorce was final, and apparently that was on January 21st, 2010, in the, in the uh, parenting plan that was established, was there a default to the Summit County rules? There was no fault. There was actually, uh, there was alternating weekends and one day during the week, which w was being exercised until approximately 2016. I guess I'm asking because I know that obviously he, the uh, mother has attached a copy of the default rules, which in the case of a child 14 and over, it's at the time the child and the parent can agree that was never established as a, as a routine in this case. It was not. And we actually cited the, the local rules in our appellate brief, much to the dismay of uh, opposing counsel. But yes, it says they can discuss things, but it's supposed to happen. In this situation, the, the guardian recommended that there be one hour every week that father and daughter would get together. The trial court judge didn't even accept the decision of the, of the recommendation of the guardian in this case. He just said, well, they can, can do, the father will have parenting time as the two of them agree. You've had three years of the, the child not cooperating, the child not coming. Mother, going, going to Lowe's, Mid-shopping trip goes to Lowe's to pick the child up from dad. Thankfully, the, uh, unfortunately I should say, the police were called, the police intervened, and the police actually made sure the daughter went back with dad. That's the only time on the, in the record where you see somebody stepped in to effectively continue the parenting time. Now, if there's problems between a child and a parent, that's what counseling is for. You can't have counseling that gets torpedoed by a child who says nothing. They empowered this child at a very young age. It's unfortunate. Oddly enough, as I'm, as I'm walking over here, there's a sign across from the parking garage that says, uh, what you allow will continue. How poignant that that happens on that way walking in here. But that's exactly what this case is about. They let the child be empowered to call the shots and the mother assisted. Mother's getting calls from the child while she's with her father on father's time. One time, there's a, in the record, there's a session where they're watching television. Mid-TV show, daughter gets up and says, I gotta go. And the mother's there to pick her up. Now, you can't say that the mother's not in contempt of court. She can, anybody can go in and say, you know, I did what I could. And, and they made a, a, a deal about how big the daughter was. We can't physically, do you really want the mom to push the phys physically get the child in the car? No, we don't. As the, as the Justice Carr said, Incentives to deter further action. Does the child get denied her phone? I mean, that's the consummate punishment these days. Children live on their phones. Nothing's done with that. Does the child get denied use of a, a car? Nothing's done with that. The, the reason there's contempt, civil contempt, is to affect behavior. You put a purge order on that says you can purge your, your contempt by making this happen. That didn't happen in this case. Mother was, was not found in contempt of court, despite the... Well, let me ask you a question here. Yes, Your Honor. Child, daughter, 16-year-old teenager, you can't have your car, you can't have your phone, you're grounded, you're not going to see your prom. Tell me how that enhances a relationship with Dad. Well, if you don't go with dad, you can't have your car. Well, that's what if I mean. you don't go yes, with, exactly you don't take I mean. it away, you make the threat. <laughs> How else could they do this in this situation? 16 year old, I understand, that's a different story. This started when this kid was 14. It's a kind of a different scenario. And there's, there's certainly is case law on each side, whether what do you have to do as a parent. It's a difficult decision, but you can't let the 14 year old wag the dog. And that's what they did in this case. They let this fester. And now it, it breaks down to, to the trial court saying, they can have the child, have parenting time with the child as they agree. There is no way they're going to agree without some kind of motivation, some kind of deterrence, as Justice Carr said in the first appeal, some kind of way to make this happen. The courts are very, very creative, or should be. 
There's reunification counseling that could be used. Well, there's, there's, you're talking about incentives to incentivize the child to perform the way you want the child to perform. The dad could also offer incentives to encourage the child to do what dad wants, too, which would be positive reinforcement rather than negative reinforcement, right? Absolutely so correct, So there's, there's things that could have been done on both sides to enhance the relationship, to encourage more cooperation with dad. I, I would agree with you, Your Honor. That's why I think counseling is going to help. The joint counsel that they had didn't work. The, the, I don't know if you saw the nail in the head reference to the, the tape they saw, but that was not the right counselor for these people. And I think it was more, I, I don't know, I wasn't. According to who? According to both, well, the child didn't testify, but father mentioned that they both looked at each other and freaked that, what's going on here? Because they did something weird with the nail as they're walking out of it. It's some kind of counseling session. I don't know. The bottom line is you got to give it more than six and a half months after three years, uh, almost three years, of non-parenting time. you got to do something. You can't just tell the, the child, ah, call your dad when you want to see him. Okay, that's, that's, and I quote the, the, the case we cited in, the, in our brief, Giuliano, that says, a non-custodial parent right of visitation with his child or children is a natural right and should be denied only under extraordinary circumstances. Someone, they, they may submit that these are extraordinary circumstances. They're odd. There's no doubt about it. But that's what counselors, there's professionals, trained professionals that deal with this every day. This man was not a physical risk to his child. It was not a mental risk to his child. There was talks of the daughter saying, well, I have had panic attacks. I don't want to go to your house. Nothing was done regarding the panic attacks. And we have the school counselor testify, I'm sorry, the school principal testify, no, she's a, she's a fine child. We don't have any issues with anything. Now, if there's panic attacks and there's other issues, that would, you would think that would show up in other areas of that child's life. I, I said, thought the whole issue was she had the panic attacks when she had to be with father. That's what she claims, Your Honor. That's what counseling deals with panic attacks. No, after that, there's no issue showing she was dealt, that they dealt anywhere with panic attacks. That's why Dad can't figure out what's going on. That's why Dan wants to see uh, the notes to see what, you know, is this child doing more with the counseling than she was doing with dad. For instance, just staying home or calling mom to end it all. Does she just show up at the counselor and say, hi, I'm here. Uh, yeah, it's a sunny day. You know, I'm going to prom next week. Thanks. And I'll see you next week. We don't know. Father didn't know that. That's why he was inquiring. But I submit to the court that there's got to be some way that this court or that, that they can motivate mother to cooperate. Thank you, Your Honor. And that is by finding of contempt. There is no question. Appellee's brief clearly shows, well, she did this, mom did this, mom did that, mom. That's all well and good and thankful. And father was appreciative that that happened, parenting that happened when it happened. But mom also picked the child up, tried to get the child from Lowe's, picked the kid up mid-television show. It's replete. Another time that the child is reported, I'm not coming, dad, I'm sick. And then she's at the school event. You don't let children do those things. Because that simply empowers them to say, well, I, the hell with this. I'm not going to go with my dad. And you, you can't do that. Father has a right to be a father. And that's what has to be recognized by the court. There's so many options available to the court, rather than empowering that child via mom and with mom's assistance. There's got to be meaningful visitation. Meaningful visitation. The guardian tried that. She was hopeful that, I'm, I'm sure, that spending an hour every Sunday with dad maybe they can figure things out and get it done. The trial judge says, no, we don't need that, that schedule. We're just going to have the two of them figure out when they're going to see each other. That's after, as I said, empowering that child. So I would so switch. How, how old is the child now? 16 and a half. She'll be 17 in June, I believe. The, um, again, the other issue with regard to the bus rides, mom tries to say, well, the dad was supposed to pick the child up at school. I'm at work. But the child, you know, gets on the school bus rather than gets going home with dad. Well, mom comes home from work. She sees the child there. Why doesn't she take the child to the father's house? Who lets the child call the shots like that? I know perhaps it's a difficult situation, but that's her father. I submit to the court that the trial court should have found mother in contempt and motivate a change behavior per order. The child's not at an age, at the time of these original motions, that she could firmly and independently decide not to have parenting time. Not without something showing 
that there, it's, you know, give it a shot. Give it, go to cus, uh, counseling. This, it's, again, that non-custodial parent's right, father in this case, his right for time with his child is a natural right and should be denied only under extraordinary circumstances. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. May it please this honorable court, Mr. Reddy and the Sheets. My name is Roe Fox and I'm here on behalf of Lynn Bohannon. Uh, I first would like to apologize on an administrative issue. I was reviewing my brief that I filed online yesterday and today and noted that for some reason my table of contents, I believe, from the first go around at this court was the only part of that initial brief that made it to the second brief. I don't know how, but the balance of the brief is, is accurate. Uh, this court did consider the Bohannon case previously. Uh, it considered it on three issues, whether or not Mr. Bohannon had enough time to litigate his issues, whether or not my client should be found in contempt, and whether or not uh, there was an error made in the child support calculation. On appeal today are really, um, I'll say, some abstract arguments. Most importantly, their assignment of error number two. Uh, I, I would consider a lot of counsel's argument on appeal, particularly with respect to assignment of error number one, nothing but wordplay. This court didn't issue an order in its previous reversal that it should institute a judgment and find my client in contempt. Uh, this court did, in fact, recognize, though, that the case had been languishing for a while and that he was entitled under due process rights to a more lengthy hearing. In particular, and I quote from that decision, um, that the trial court uh, limits, quote, imposed by the magistrate for the hearing precluded the parties from presenting this critical perspective for consideration. That comment was made after discussing the input from the guardian ad litem. She did not testify at the initial trial because of the brevity that was given both parties. I think that's important because the court did finally get to hear from the guardian ad litem in a day and a half trial. Now, when, Mr., when the uh, appellant when father uh, claims that he didn't have enough time to litigate his issues, he had a day and a half. And he put everything out there that he wanted to. He had his girlfriend testify. He had a chance to discuss the matter with the guardian ad litem. And he testified freely and fully himself. At every step of the way, he continued to just show his aggressive, boorish, unsympathetic behavior towards children. Was there a camera with this child? Uh, I don't believe one was done in this instance because I know the guardian ad litem had talked on multiple occasions with the child. There was no question that the child could form her own opinions. If I recall correctly, though, it's not in my brief. I believe I asked Mr. Oh, I believe I asked the appellant on cross examination if, in fact, uh, he thought she could form her own opinions, and I believe he said he did, or he did think that that was the case. Um, this idea that they're now pleading again for counseling. Mr. Bohannon has been involved in counseling with one or more of his children over, the la children over the last 10 years with as many counselors as he's almost had lawyers in this case. I think they've had approximately four counselors at different points dip their toe in the case at Mr. Bohannon's request. And every single time, he does something to torpedo the, the counseling. When his daughter, uh, the child that's the subject of this case, finally finds a, counsel finds a counselor, Valerie Schmidt, that she can confide in, that she can release information to, that she trusts. Mr. Bohannon does what Mr. Bohannon does, and that is he files a complaint against her for not turning over information to him, which quite frankly under the law he should not have turned over information to. Um, in addition to the fact he complains about it and files a complaint with her with the state bar about this, even though she'd been providing him updates. The idea that these, these children could appreciate or improve from counseling with Mr. Bohannon is just trying to put a square peg in a round hole because it just doesn't work with Mr. Bohannon. He was physically violent with his first child, has no relationship with that child or boy. He was physically aggressive. I believe his relationship with the middle daughter was described as tumultuous and she claimed to the guardian ad litem that Mr. Bohannon had actually choked her. This of course went south around the age of 15, 16. Coincidentally, it's now going south, or did go south, around the age of 15 or 16 with this child. Uh, at the point in time when the middle child was suffering the abuse of Mr. Bohannon, 
um, they had restricted his visitation to one time a month for dinner only. He did not go through trial on that. He consented to that schedule and did not appeal anything involving that. Then we get to the youngest child, uh, who at the time of trial was, in fact, 16 years old. Uh, as Mr. Wright points out, was physically larger than mom. Father testifies, I don't want mom physically putting the child in the car. I don't think that's good for her. She needs to come on her own. Most of the litigation history in this case had been mom's fault, mom's fault, mom's fault. Now, we were somewhat relieved that at least on the appellant's brief, he starts blaming it somewhat on the child. What Mr. Bohannon needs to do is start blaming himself and look in the mirror. The real problems, though, with this child, who, at the time that order I referenced on the middle child to one time a month, that had gone into place, the youngest child still had approximately every other weekend or so with Mr. Bohannon. I should say appellant, I apologize. <clears throat> Until the spring of 2016, and this is moving forward, this is where the contempts come into play. Spring of 2016, um, the child in this instance uh, comes home from a Washington, D.C. trip for spring break. She got spring break with dad. Mom didn't pre prevent that. Um, comes home and is upset, crying uh, from this trip the minute she gets into mom's house. What happened? Basically, the long and the short of it is, and it's in the uh, statement of facts, and it's in the transcript. Daughter reports to the GAL ultimately, and then to mom in this instance, that dad said to me, if you really loved me, you'd see me more, and if not, I'm going to kill myself. That's a lot to lay on a then 15-year-old child. Right after that, we are scheduled for summer break in 2016. Now, interestingly enough, in 2015, summer break went fine. They alternated weeks. We had just gotten out of court again on another post-decree motion of, of the appellants. And we came to an arrangement where, this, uh, where the appellant was going to get half the summer. And they alternated weeks. Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, the appellant uh, files a motion for contempt because the summer schedule isn't put into place leading into summer of 16. And he says he had sent to Appellee's counsel a proposed schedule. Well, he didn't, and he ended up admitting that on the stand. Once the schedule was submitted to her on the eve of summer 2016, uh, Ms. the appellee looked at it, said, you're taking more than one week at a time. Remember, this is after the Washington, D.C. trip. Says, the child cannot do that, does not want to do that. Why don't we just do what we did before, and which is referenced as a fallback position in the prior order? Why don't we alternate weeks? He refuses and acknowledges on the record during his testimony that had he just agreed to alternating weeks, the schedule would have been put into place. But no, he had to have it his way. Because everything that has occurred in this case over the last 10 years where there's been a dispute has been because the appellee refuses to see anyone else's point of view, including uh, appellant, refuses to see anybody's point of view, including appellee and any of her children. So we go through the summer, uh, summer 2016. He does get some time. He clearly does not get half the time. Uh, and he acknowledges on the record that that's largely his fault for not agreeing. We have this every other weekend schedule that's supposed to include one evening during the week. It's conceded that he can't do the one evening during the week. He's never filed a motion to modify because he took a job in Columbus. Trying to pin a appellant down in the transcript, you'll see, to where he actually lives. He, he notes approximately three different residences. But for the purposes of that schedule, he had been most of the time in Columbus. What had happened was, because they had, we had gotten tired of Appalee being blamed for everything, we took her out entirely. He was to pick up on Fridays, said he could, pick up the child on weekends, and he could enjoy his time. He would go as far as to send notes to the principal, who would deliver those notes to the teacher, who would then remind the child, please go home with your father, he's going to be waiting for you. Now my, my client is down in Canton, working down in camp that she's a half hour away. She doesn't get off till five. She has nothing to do with the pick up and drop off. Uh, Mr. Bohan, the appellant would show up uh, and the child would take the bus home. And she'd rather go home and sit by herself waiting for mom to come home than go with her father. He would call the police. Uh, he would send texts to her. She has repeatedly indicated that she would in fact have these panic attacks even considering having time 
with uh, appellant in this matter. He complains further about not getting time on Christmas one year because um, uh, he had suggested, actually he had suggested that, that he have a week, the beginning week of Christmas vacation, he planned to take her all the way to Las Vegas at a time when he knew the child didn't want to go with him for three days in town. He also wanted to take my client's Christmas vacation by doing that. My client refused that. He ended up at another occasion coming up, and my client, when the child was sick, she actually gave her him Christmas one time in lieu of him missing some other time because she had been sick for that time. My client has done everything, including threaten, discipline of the child. Uh, she has told her that if you don't go with your dad, now remember, we're talking Friday nights for a young teenager. If you don't go with your dad, you don't go anywhere. Guess what? She would rather not go anywhere. She sat at home Friday nights, Saturday nights, and in lieu of going with her father, would stay at home with mother. I would point out to the court what I pointed out in my, our brief, and that is, there's a couple cases, one from the 9th District of 2003, the Yannick case, which I think is actually worse, far worse than what's going on in this case, and that is a, a mother who would constantly question a child about whether or not how, they, how visitation was going, when she'd come back, when the child would come back, uh, uh, inquire about how those things are going, um, but never actively interfered with the visitation at all. Uh, in this instance, in the Yannick case, there was no evidence the mom actively interfered with the parenting time, and the court, this court said there would be no contempt. Uh, this, is, this case is also, as I point out in my brief, remarkably similar to Dodowski. In Dodowski, which was a 4th District case from 2005, the child was 16 years old. There was an increasingly volatile relationship with the father. Uh, the court found no contempt and actually put it in the lap of the judge and said, would we expect the judge to go out and move a 16-year-old from one place to another to basically to force the parenting time? Uh, and in that case... The court also recognized that the non-custodial parent was part of the problem. In this instance, all Mr. Bohannon has to do is accept responsibility. In fact, the GAL was replete with testimony when she was on the stand that the children all said he just needs to take responsibility for what he's doing to us. That if he was just more compassionate, if he would just consider our wishes, uh, things might get better, but as they were, they were disastrous with this man. Probably the most toxic relationship in any domestic relations case I've ever been involved in where there hasn't been a criminal charge. It's that toxic. You talked earlier about the counseling. He has insisted on going and getting uh, the child's counseling records even though it came out on the witness stand that his own counselor said don't get those records. Everything that has occurred in this case is because father is, is actually, contrary to what's being suggested, counseling averse. Things just don't go his way in counseling. And it's also problematic for him because it's just the way he approaches his children. He, uh, as, as the child in this instance described in the guardian ad litem, she feels cyberbullied. She tries to reach out to him, and he will not be compassionate and caring in response to him. At the trial, there was a text that was submitted in evidence that the child wrote over summer vacation. Dad, I don't want to go with you. I can't take that much time with you. And she says, just because, just could you ease up a bit? I'm just trying to have a nonstop summer, but right now being with you for half the summer when I couldn't even see you for three hours at the beginning of the year without a panic attack, it's just a little impossible to ask of me right now. I know it's going to get hostile if I try to leave. I would like to go see you, hostile at his house. I would like to go see you, but I physically can't go have a summer with you, and Dad, I love you. These children have always said things like that to him. They are torn in this relationship with their father. Of course, he doesn't say, I love you too, and let's try to get together for an afternoon at the park or something else. He responds, your comments and so-called panic attack match your conditioning. At some point, you must own your own actions. Presently, your actions to me and your grandparents do not say one of love. Mr. Bohannon, the appellant herein, wouldn't know love 
if it hit him in the face. He's been abusive to these children. He's been abusive to the Apple League. We don't think she's in contempt because she's done nothing wrong in this except try to encourage the counseling and the parenting time. She's tried to impose discipline. And she runs the risk, as I believe Your Honor pointed out, what's going to happen to the child when, if this gets pushed so far, the only parental relationship she has worthwhile is impaired because she keeps insisting that the child do something she knows is wrong. Thank you. I would ask the court to consider the record before the court. My opposing counsel just got up and told all kinds of things that aren't in this court's record. Wordplay. Imagine telling you three justices that we engaged in wordplay when we quoted Justice Carr's very seminal quote that puts it right on, on the head on, head on the nail on the head. I agree 100%, Your Honor, and, and eventually the hearing was had. And shame on father for being aggressive or boorish behavior. He wants to see his child. Maybe he's not the father that the kids want, but he's their father. That's what counseling's all about, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Just so you know, I paused and Judge Carr asked the question. <laughs> I don't feel cheated. Okay. All right, thank you both for your presentation. With this matter, we will take the matter.